nor are my eyes haughty. I busy not myself with great things, not with things too sublime for me. Nay, rather, I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child. Like a weaned child on its mother's lap, so is my spirit within me. O unified government commissioners, hope in the Lord, both now and forever. Hope in the Lord, both now and forever. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sister, for being here tonight. I'll ask uh, Ms. Cobbins, are there any revisions to tonight's agenda? There are no revisions, Mr. Mayor. All right, our first order of business is our consent agenda. Does any member of the commission, staff, or citizen in attendance wish to set any item aside? You would need to step forward at this time and state your name and the city of residency for the record and ask that an item be set aside. Anything not set aside will be voted upon by a single vote. Move to approve all items on the consent agenda. Second. Let the record show no one is moving forward to set an item aside. It is properly before us. Roll call. Roll call. Markley? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Johnson? Aye. King? Aye. The vote is 9 to 0. That motion carries. That brings us to item number 1 on the Standing Committee's agenda. Um, it's the resolution for the sale general obligation bonds. I will um, turn that over to Debbie Johnshire for presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this resolution is for the sale of general obligation refunding bonds. This is a refunding of our 2008 series bonds. It is in accordance with our approved debt policy. We believe we have the opportunity to achieve a more favorable interest rate, and refunding it now would estimate a savings of about $2.7 million over the remaining term of the bonds. May I move to approve as approved by Standing Committee, or as presented, rather? All right, and the Standing Committee voted on this and approved it unanimously, is that correct? It is correct. And it is not on consent because it has because been fast-tracked. Because correct. of fast-tracked. So. All right, so it has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Roll call. Markley? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mukia? Aye. Johnson? Aye. King? Aye. The vote is 9 to 0. That motion carries. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the administrator's agenda. Item number one is a res resolution authorizing lease documents for refinancing of the BPU office building. I'll turn this over to Mr. Levin. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. The, the, uh, the first item before you is uh, a required lease document for us to move forward with a sale by the Public Building Commission. We actually conducted the bond sale today and it will be presented to the Bu Public Building Commission later today but but the lease agreement uh, it accomplishes certain objectives it, it there's a transfer from the unified government of the title of the property to the Public Building Commission and that is the BPU office building the UG then will enter into a lease with the Public Building Commission and the BPU finally has a sublease with the unified government and, and that structure allows for uh, bonds to be issued the BPU will be responsible for the debt payments uh, it was a five-year financing and I'll just briefly state the results of the sale that occurred today uh, we, we achieved an interest rate of 1.17 percent the current remaining interest rate for the five-year period was five percent so a significant reduction a three hundred and ninety two thousand dollars savings uh, to the Board of Public Utilities through 2021 but the action before you is just to approve the lease agreement between these parties Commissioner Merguia thank you mayor mayor did um, these items with um, accounting and finance the refinancing the bonding issues item one two three four 
um, not that we don't enjoy hearing from our CFO, uh, Lou Levin and Debbie Johncher, um, do they require a public hearing? Because they were unanimously approved. I think the only reason they're in front of us on non-consent is, as you said, because they were fast-tracked. That's not quite – it's somewhat correct. But the, re the reason why you ha we have not before you today is – you actually have to approve the results of the bond sale, not for these first two items, but the latter three. The, the sale occurred today, and uh, the specifics of those, of those sales need to be approved. Uh, Commissioner, okay. what you're hearing, though, is these are all items we've been working for some time, so you're catching different versions of them. They're just different steps in the process that we had to go through to use it between the tools you're familiar with, between the BPU, between the health clinic, different steps in the process to use the Public Building Commission and do it for the financing. So you've approved these projects Multiple many times. times over. It's just this stage that comes into it. Yeah, so I appreciate the explanation. I just, like you said, when we've heard the project over and over again, again, not that we don't want to hear from all of you, I just assume we can it's, move. Yes, yeah, so it's your pleasure. If um, anyone would like to make a motion. Um, no Second. Okay. So if you want more presentation, we can do more. Um, Commissioner McKiernan. The only thing I'd ask is the same thing I ask when we're in standing committee, Lou, and that is if you are satisfied with the results of the bond sale and if there's anything that we should know that's a negative related to any of these projects, hearing that you're satisfied with the outcome of the bond sale, as this first one was, and not hearing any negatives, I would just move right on through since we have yeah. previously approved the projects. Right. Very positive about the bond sales that occurred today. I am going to ask, uh, after, after the final votes on these items, for Dave Sp uh, McGilvery of Springs to just uh, have a brief discussion of, of how he views where we are in the marketplace and how the credit agencies oh, perceive cool. these sales today. Yeah, that's, great. that's great. Okay, so item, we're on item number one. Item number one. Well, we, item number item, one. Item, one. item number one has been moved and seconded. Roll call. Roll call. Markley? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. The vote is 9-0. to zero. That motion carries. Move to approve item number two. Second. Seeing no discussion, roll call. Roll call. Markley? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. The vote is 9-0. to zero. That motion carries. Item number three are the sale of the general obligation bonds. Move to approve. Now, do we need separate motions for the ordinance and the resolution, or can we do it with one? Mayor, I, my understanding is that the, the second is contingent upon the first, and Bond Council recommends separate votes for these. Okay. So is the motion for the first one? Second. Yes. It's been moved and seconded for the first portion of the ordinance. Seeing no discussion, roll call. Roll call, Markley? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. Motion to approve the resolution? Second. It's been moved and seconded. There is uh, seeing no discussion, roll call. Roll call, Markley? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. The vote is 9-0. to zero. That motion carries. Move to approve item number four. Do we need, can we do those in one, one motion for both items? It has been moved. Second. It has been seconded. Roll call. Roll call, Markley? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Johnson? Kane? Aye. Vote is 9-0. to zero. That motion carries. So, uh, Ms. Johncher, can you give us the um, interest rates and have Mr. McGilvery come forward as well? Sure. The interest rates on the bond sale were, um, we had a 20-year financing at 2.7%. The amount was $26.8 million. And the uh, temp notes, there were two issues. The tax exempt was 60.4 million, an interest rate of 0.61%. And 
and the taxable was 5.4 million with an interest rate of 1.10 percent. That's fantastic. Excellent work. Thank you. Good evening, Dave McGilvery, Chairman of Springstead, your financial advisor. Uh, Lou has asked me to cover two areas. I'll try to be brief. Thank you. First is the market. I know I've been saying this for a number of years, but Thank the you. Thank you. market is uh, very low. And it's uh, why it's a little bit lower than before is uh, all these sort of interest rate markets are pegged off the U.S. Treasuries with the world in chaos. It uh, used to be that uh, if you got below 3% on the 10-year maturity, you were doing well. Well, now it's below 2% at 1.87. So that's helping everything. The other thing particular to this sale is uh, in this part, January and February, the municipal market is always very low because there's not a lot of bonds out there and because investors who did a lot of tax selling before December 31st come back in, high demand, low supply forces the municipal rates down. So excellent time to sell bonds and the rates you got today were among the lowest you've ever received. Um, second item uh, is the credit ratings. Uh, Lou provided a summary of them. I'll just recap. In, in terms of background, remember the highest possible you can get is AAA. Then there's a double A, where uh, your standard and poor's rating is uh, single A, and you're at an A1, and that's the Moody's rating is an A1. A1 is the higher end of the A category, B double A, and then junk bond below that. So you're, you're in the top tier, um, particularly with the S&P. Um, I'm just going to go through uh, their summary items very briefly. Lou's covered them in, the mo in the, his memo. Um, among the categories they have, they have uh, strong budget flexibility. And what this means is the fact that you've been able to grow your fund balance over the last few years, it gives you flexibility because you've made the tough decisions to increase your fund balance. And that's a key item in looking at the review. Two, um, strong, uh, very strong liquidity, and that's a measure of sort of cash throughout the entire system as compared to your, your expenditures. So. You've been able in a lot of areas to build up some cash, and that certainly helps them, and certainly with any credit rating, um, that's uh, beneficial. Um, let's see. Um, I think that uh, one of the big ones is very strong management, and when they say management, it means uh, both the professional staff, what they do, but also means uh, your decisions, making the tough decisions, like I said, to increase fund balance and other things in the budget. So it's decision making, it's policies, it's adhering to policies, it's planning efforts, um, those sorts of things they look at and they all contribute to the management profile. And you are listed as a very strong management. So uh, under the things you can control in your credit rating, you, know, um, you can control management issues, control some of the fund balance and budgetary things, and control some debt levels. So. Uh, very high marks, uh, very good credit ratings, and um, here again, uh, the credit rating is a key determinant in driving down those interest rates, leading to lower property taxes, lower user fees, etc. So I'd be glad to take any questions. Commissioner McKiernan? Just, uh, this kind of is a direct follow-on, it's kind of like, yeah, I think this is right, but are we, is it the case that if a little's good, more is better as it relates to our fund balance? and our ratings, that if we are successful in intentionally growing our fund balance even beyond the rate at which we've been growing it, we could expect some sort of similar movement in our rating. Um, more fund balance, is, fund balance is a key item they look at. More fund balance is positive. You can't, because they look at all of these things, you can't say if I do this thing, it'll raise the rating. So it's a combination of all of the factors. So I can't say if the fund balance goes way up, your rating will go up. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a key driver. They have weightings now. And the fund balance area, budget, uh, structural budget balance or surpluses are big in those weightings. I would note, uh, and the uh, mayor was on the phone, um, during the Moody's rating report, that was, you know, they have the lower rating. And, you know, we, we thought we had the analysts almost there. We was making sounds like, you know, there's improved uh, uh, jobs, there's improved fund balance, good cash position. Maybe that would lead to something, but it didn't lead to a change this time. 
And could I follow that up then? Would, would it also make sense that if we were to able to spend cash for more, which means we bond less, which means we take on less additional debt in the future and manage to shrink the amount of debt that we are carrying going forward, that that would have a similarly positive effect on our credit rating? Correct. I okay. mean, one of the concerns is the debt area. To the extent that goes down, it's a positive in terms of rating uh, profile. Commissioner Johnson. The interest rate increase we saw a couple of months ago through the Fed, oh. through the Fed what, what impact has that really had on, on, on rates and borrowings, um, and particularly as you're talking about the fact that our, our rates are so low at this particular time? For your bond, well, for your bond transactions and generally, not much, probably nothing in terms of your bond. You know, the, F the Federal Reserve changes short-term interest rates in a couple of months. You're going out years. The fact that they went up so small was really a non-event. I mean, it's more newspaper ink in term, than material in terms of interest rates. Is that too bold a statement? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Appreciate it. One of the things I want to compliment our financial team on, uh, Mr. Bach on, and our uh, financial advice that we get, our bond council, we have a very active debt management program here. I mean, we when we have notes to call at higher interest rates, there's an active process of refunding those bonds and changing the financing for more favorable terms. You can see in your book um, estimated uh, savings that we're seeing because of these actions. Um, that kind of active debt management goes on behind the scenes, um, but it saves us millions of dollars. Yeah. And so we make a... You know, we get a make a big deal when we get a fifty thousand dollar grant. Woohoo! You know, we're excited about it. Our finance team, because of their active debt management and our good bond counsel and how we manage that going forward, is very professional and saves the taxpayers literally millions of dollars and makes our job a lot easier. So, thanks to you and thanks to our team um, working on that, Mr. Bach, for your overseeing that. I did, I did have one comment on the refunding yes now we're not selling the refunding tonight we're selling them on February 25th and the reason we didn't do that is you had five different pieces of debt in the market today and the refundings would have created even more and you want to eliminate confusion by the people that are bidding on these so we'll be back in a couple weeks but that's the reason we're not doing them tonight because we want to take care of your new money need new construction needs first excellent thank you all right that brings us to item number five, which is the survey, our community, our community survey. I'll turn that over to Mr. Bach. Thank you, Mayor. This is the follow-up to where we were a, a few weeks ago uh, when we presented the in special session, the survey, and the status where we were. Uh, Mr. Grimm has taken this information, gone back, we've worked through it, and he has compiled it in a manner which we believe is in accordance with what the Commission is thinking, but we certainly want to take any input if you've had a chance to look through it this week of how the survey is listed out and, and let us know if this is the direction you want to go or if we need to make additional changes. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Grimm and let him uh, lead us through this. Thanks, Mr. Bach. Good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, before I get started, I want to just say we have uh, Nick Jones with ETC here. He's representing them, and uh, if we have any questions for him, he's available. Just a quick summary. Uh, during the January 7th special session, we reviewed a seven-page survey and uh, an associated costs. The discussion uh, that evening focused quite a bit on the level of analysis. So do we want to look at, at the results of the survey at the commission district level or the neighborhood level? And uh, I, the, the direction we had was to uh, shorten the survey and, and the savings that we realized from doing that, we could shift that to uh, getting more completed responses and then uh, getting that, that level of analysis at the neighborhood level. Uh, I will mention, and I, you, I think you've, that survey was in your agenda packet, you've seen that. I will mention one, one specific item you asked us to do was to lump all the services together, all the city services and county services. I showed that to Chris Tatham at ETC. And uh, it was his advice to, to split those two out. And I think you saw that. Now, we're not calling it city services. It's neighborhood community services and then county services. And the reason being, it just allows for a little bit more analysis. If you were to look at that, um, after each of those, the neighborhood and county services, it, it asked the respondent to um, emphasize the top four. So that, 
I just want to explain that's why that, those are broken out that way. Uh, beyond that, so you saw the sur survey in your agenda packet, then a cost table. So I'm going to just see where the commission wants to go. If we want to throw up a copy of the survey, go through questions, or just shift to the cost. Mike, do you want to talk about how you did consolidate some of the community level questions into some of these presenting? Community as far as the services? Well, yeah, I mean, like you put the grocery store question in. I oh, I understand. Okay, so questions, I think uh, 15 and 16. We can talk about 15. There was a change I think you saw. There were two questions that um, the commission, there's a discussion that you could have that one page of unique questions. Uh, we took a couple of those questions from uh, one of the commissioners or two of the commissioners, one page unique questions and put them in here. And I think that was uh, viewed as kind of bringing, bringing that in, that those questions into this survey. Um, but, but we did strike on question 15. The question was worded about uh, the uh, please rate how important each of the following types of businesses are to be present in your community. We changed that wording a little bit to, to say following types of businesses are needed in your community. So you saw that, that change, if, that, if you're agreeable to that. Um, so beyond that, is there... Any other specific questions? Commissioner Walker. I, uh, in reviewing this, uh, it triggered an interest of mine that I don't feel is addressed, and I certainly didn't help address it when I first reviewed the possibilities. Uh, under pub it, maybe it goes under public safety, maybe it goes someplace else. You have the question of quality of animal control in your neighborhood. Um, I uh, I would like, well, uh, perhaps I should, uh, you know, in, I guess it was 2013, we had an ordinance before us on breed differentiation. Um, probably no vote has uh, followed me in terms of reading about breed differentiation I would like if, if I could, if if it were my choice my vote might be different now and one of the things that might change my vote is how the public feels in particular about specific ordinances that differentiate a breed right now we're talking about pit bulls I don't know how the question would be properly framed without creating a bias. Uh, maybe, maybe you just say, uh, should pit bull be banned? Yet, or, or are you happy with the pit bull ban and your level of satisfaction? Whatever the the formatting would be. Um, you, you, I'm, I'm on the horns of a dilemma here. The pit bull, whether rightly or wrongly, has a a certain reputation, a cachet, if you will, and you either love them or you give them a wide berth whenever you see them. And there is a need on the part of the people that give a wide berth to feel protected, and then there are those that want pit bulls that they, they love them. They think they're the greatest dog on the planet, and it's bad owners, not bad dogs. So I... If the, if the commission were inclined, I would add a question that would give me some information about the public's temperature on lifting that particular band, band and, uh, or perhaps getting a sense of whether we ought to be banning more, more kinds of dogs than we already do, you know? All right. I, I might add to that, Commissioner. Um, it might be worth, and we've condensed it quite a bit, and I like the condensing, so I'm not wanting to lengthen it a lot. But it might be worth doing an uh, animal section that would include quality of animal control in your neighborhood. It could con include breed-specific ban information. It could also include um, chickens and large animals. Yeah. Um, and how we, because it would be helpful to get the temperature of the community, because typically what happens if you have a hearing on chickens, only the chicken people show up and not their neighbors. 
And if you have a meeting on pit bulls, the pit bull people from all over the metro area and the region and the world fly in for it and not neighbors. So this would be a good opportunity to get information on some animal pieces if we could keep it concise. With, I don't want to add a page on animals, right? But I think maybe we could add, Commissioner, I think you're on to something in terms of there might be an opportunity to get some feedback that would be helpful moving forward. So, okay, Commissioner McKiernan. Commissioner Walker, thank you for coming over to the survey side. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the survey. That's right. <laughs> One of the things that, and, and, and Mike, I have not had a, a chance to really look at this in any depth, but I will say that at first glance, the four pages of condensed questions look very good. And with the exception of a couple of exceptions, they look like they cover all the points that we want to cover. I jump to the cost page. And if I'm reading this right, at our highest level of penetration within each district, the four-page condensed survey with one page of district level or district specific questions would be a total of $100,800. Is that, am I reading the table correctly? Correct. Which is up from our current 62.4. It is an additional expenditure. But I'll go back on record as I did in our special session in terms of saying I do believe the value we'll get from those data would warrant that expense and that ultimately we will be glad if we do expend the money for the additional penetration into each district so that we can be a little bit more targeted mm -hmm. in some of our responses. What is our deadline for actually getting back any final, final comments or questions? Well, that's up to you. Uh, ETC will need eight weeks, so two months. Oh, and, and we're trying to target an early April right. presentation for budget purposes. So, well, tomorrow would be great. Okay. I, I do want to add a comment on the cost. Uh, I talked to Chris about that, and, and I'll back up. So to get an analysis of the neighborhood level, we'd have to start at that, uh, the 300 per district or the 2,400, and that's a cost of 82,800. And as you recall, if you look in that, there's a line up there, that bound of error, and that's, you know, how, you know we're 95% sure, you know, plus or minus, you know, the 5.7 that the views on the survey represent the whole community. But for that extra cost, you know, we go to the 5%. So that's a 0.7% gain. Chris, I talked to him, and he said, Actually, he had a recommendation. To, he has a good feel, I think, for what all you want, and, and it would be that, that 2,400, that, so the 82,800. So you still get your neighborhood level analysis starting there, but from going to the... To the uh, so the 5.7, the plus or minus 5.7 then, is that the, the bound of error on... On the neighborhood level. On the neighborhood level? Yes. Yes, yes. yeah. And again, this goes back to where... Did we come to any conclusion on how we specify neighborhood boundaries? Because that was an unanswered question last time we got together. Well, he, Chris did say essentially the block level. I think we talked neighborhood level. I think Commissioner McGee had a neighborhood level map. He did say block level. Now, whether that's aggregated a little bit more, I, I'm not 100% sure. But, but it's, it's definitely going to be in a, a set of maps. It's just an aggregation, though, of a, couple of, of a few blocks that might even be a subset of what we would call a neighborhood, plus minus 5.7 as opposed to last time we had plus minus 8. No, did we even have the 150 per district in our last round? It was. It was, okay. It was. So we, he's suggesting that the additional 0.7 in terms of what it gives us in confidence and in what it gives us in granularity may not, we, we might want to consider whether or not it's worth the money we'd spend on it. Is that correct? Come on up, if you would, to the Come microphone, please. Come on up please. to the podium, please. And <laughs> we keep looking at you for questions. I think he's basically saying, you know, you kind of get your most bang for your buck if you do the 300 per okay. district. Um, not to talk us out of money, but, you know, uh, for, for going up 100 surveys per district, that's 800 additional surveys. So it does add quite a bit of cost. So at 300, you're still getting really good um, district-level data while having fantastic overall data. Okay. Does anyone else want to talk about the granularity and budget before we move on to more questions? Okay. Commissioner McGee. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
So Chris has seen my, you did my original survey. This is what I'm concerned about, and, and I'm all for spending less money, um, but I just want to be assured about something. When you look at the geographic area of urban districts, it is much more densely populated, so the areas are much smaller, okay? So what I heard Chris saying at our last meeting is, is we have to, get, have to get back, he said at that time, 30 surveys in a particular area to get the data to get the data to be st statistically significant. So I just want to make sure Chris is keeping in his mind that for people like myself, Commissioner McKiernan, and others that have small districts as far as geography goes, that we're still going to get that same block by block data. Because my suspicion is what Commissioner um, Townsend brought up at the last meeting is that um, it could be in more impoverished areas too, the return of the survey would be lower. I know that research suggests that. Now I didn't have that problem in my district, but since I've done this before, I'm taking responsibility and sort of helping newer commissioners that haven't done it. My concern is that if Commissioner Townsend doesn't get people to respond to that survey, her data may not be as accurate as she needs it to be by the block level. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, so as long as she's take, I mean, she's, from what I've heard her say, she's relying on that. I know Commissioner McKernan in my conversations with him is relying on that, and I absolutely am relying on that. So as long as he says we're going to get that, then I'm all for spending less money. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you, he did your survey um, quite a few years back, so I'd be, he knows, he knows what you want, and I'd be, I'd be surprised if he wasn't going to give you the, the level of analysis that you wanted at that, that block or neighborhood level. Okay, so, so long as, again, well, we can, Mr. Townsend was worried about the response rate. She was encouraging people that night to make sure to fill out their survey. So if you're good, I'm good. I just want to make well, sure she's Well, say and something about what this means in terms of minimum number that you get. You may get more from one district. Mm -hmm. But the 300 is what this company guarantees you'll have at least 300 from each district. Is that correct? Right. Okay. That's correct. And you'll just keep trying until you get them? Mm hmm Yes. Okay. Commissioner Kane. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think Commissioner uh, Walker's got it right on the head. I would, I would like to know what people think about pit bulls, chickens, you know, because the, when they, the, the folks from the pit pit bull came in here they were not people that lived here a boatload of them and and we're, we're growing chickens by the dozens so uh, it would be extremely nice to know what what folks are thinking about uh, some of the yard animals that we have and uh, I'm, I'm extremely fond of, of pit bulls and, and I would love to see us uh, bring them back if you had pit bulls I would not recommend having chickens in the same yard Commissioner Philbrook just saying. Yeah, there'd be a lot of feathers all over the place, that's for sure. You could have your own pillow company. Um, so me mentioning the animals in this is, that's great. I think, though, do we have enough time to create an accurate type questions to encompass what we really want to know? Because do you like chickens? That ain't going to make it, you know. Yeah, I like to eat chickens, you know. Chickens are okay. Um, is it okay to have 20 chickens next to me? Is it okay to have five chickens next to me? You see where I'm saying on this? We have to get really specific in our questioning with this so we get accurate answers back. For those of us that are working hard on that, <laughs> on that committee to try to create codes that work for the city and for the people that live in it. So we need specific information. So do you have examples in other communities that have asked animal type questions that we don't have to reinvent the wheel here? I would imagine just on the sheer number of surveys that I haven't seen a whole lot of animal related questions, but there's always ordinance questions that come up and they're specific. I'm sure Chris has run into more than I have. So okay. he could probably draft some, some basic questions and then we can see 
Well, I would ask, Mayor, that we um, include uh, two of the lawyers that have been working with us on our animal stuff to take a look at that with us and see if that helps give us the information we need to go for. Okay. That okay. sounds good. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Markley. Okay, so I'm just trying to get to the point of where we're going here. Last time, I thought when we left, we had kind of gotten to a point where we said if we can get all or most of the questions from our individual district surveys into the one survey, we'd rather pay more to get more questions. I'm just saying that's where we left it. Now it sounds like since we're adding to our four-page survey, and it looks like it's pretty tight, we may be getting to the five-page point just by adding our animal questions. So I guess my question is, that fifth page, it's either got to be district specific or it's got to be the animal stuff to fit in our little budget chart we have here. I'm fine with could that too. It, could it be a combination? Could it be a combination? Of adding some additional, I guess, animal related questions and then having half a page or so of. Yeah, sure. Okay. Commissioner Merguia? Yeah, so Mayor, so Markley, I hear, or Commissioner Markley, I hear where you're going, sorry. Um, uh, so this is the deal. From what I saw, Mike, because I think you shared with everybody the other questions, I don't see any one commissioner that's going to add one full page of questions. Do you see what I'm saying? So I think we're going to be fine to add it to every district, even if it is part of that one page. Do you see what I'm saying? Because some commissioners didn't even submit questions, and I know I'm the most... Well, I have appeared to be the most interested in gathering this data. So I would tell you, I don't have a full page of questions. So if people want to add on half of my personal district page the animal questions, I'm good with that. So you see, see what she's saying? Can the, can the district questions be half a page and the animal questions be half a page and still fit in this budget chart? Yes. Okay. Good. Lovely. All right. We didn't want any feathers to fly over that. <laughs> Commissioner Johnson. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and I think you all may have covered this in our initial meeting. Um, and I know we, we have a guaranteed amount that we're going to receive. I'm just curious, how many surveys does it generally, generally take in order to reach um, these particular numbers, particularly if we're looking at, say, 300 or 400? How many, how many does it take to be sent out in order to receive this particular number? Um, is it a percentage it, or is there a flat no, number? It, it varies. It, it does vary just by the kind of typically the demographic makeup of the area you're sending it to um, can impact it a lot. Uh, we've actually seen um, actually higher response rates lately, which is kind of interesting. It's, it's good, right. which is great. Um, uh, a great response rate would be 30 percent, um, but anywhere from probably 15 to 30 percent. Okay, very good. So two years ago, we there were 3,600 mailed out. So I would I would assume that if we go to 300, it might be, I'm guessing, double that. You know, roughly. Uh, oh yeah, 7,200. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mailed out. In order to receive that, so 15 to 30 percent, depending on the time of year and other Depending variables. On a lot of things, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Commissioner Walker. Well, I'm I'm just gonna repeat what I think somebody else may may have said in their message. I I, I did not favor this. <laughs> and I was opposed. I lost that fight. Okay, so that's how it is. But I guess having lost it, my attitude is if we're in for a penny, we need to be in for a pound. We need to get the maximum utility and information that we can get from this. So if that means we have to spend a little more to make this more meaningful, then that's fine. I probably will vote the same way the next time this survey question comes up, but having lost that, that's why I think we should maximize the information that we get out of it. All right. I would ask also one um, request I have on page three at the bottom Question number 14, which goes to the listening tour questions, I would ask that you add a number 12, which is other. Is there any way to get an other category for something that is not listed? That's a question that's been very important in the listening tour. Is there a way to do it? Is it too hard to quantify with a, an open-ended other? 
a write-in or other, you know just a category where pe where if there's if it's not one of those eleven, then what? You but see mayor, if you just ask for other, then the only data you're going to get back is that I'm going to grossly exaggerate this: that ninety percent of the people want other. What you're looking for is what do you want? Right. No, that's right. Yeah. No, that's right. And oh, do you see what I'm talking about? Bottom of page three, number fourteen. Under street resurfacing, number 12, other or something that's not listed. Can you do that? I, I, I would think you maybe would want a separate question like a 14A, because what that 14 does is ask you to select the top three. Uh, okay. So if you were to put another, then you're asking somebody to, that's going to be one of their top three. And I don't know up. if you want to. So 14A. Yeah, it could even be just to follow up and are there any other. I'll trust your judgment on how to best ask that question. But yeah, that would just essentially be a line, so sure. Okay. All right. Any other comments about the survey? Commi uh, Commissioner, uh, Administrator Bach. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page as we leave here, and then from a timing perspective. So we're going to go develop four or five questions to come together from an animal-related questionnaire section. Commissioners, we still have some district level questions. So, Mike, do you have those questions that you know that commissioners want to ask? There, there were three commissioners that provided questions, and that was my understanding. All those were over, two of them were over one page. But now it was my understanding that when we brought on questions uh, 15 and 16, that would kind of satisfy that. So, do we. So if we need to go back and revisit what questions are going okay, to go so on and after and the that's, dog that's question. That's what I was afraid of because I think Mike feels like he wove in your questions into what he's asking. But if you're still feeling like you want those questions singled out separate, no. then he needs those. So you're, tar you're talking really about me. <laughs> well, there's a couple of you. And, and so, um, so I would just tell you I think you did what we asked you to do, which is, as, as Administrator Box said, you've taken our questions and you've asked them for the county. Uh, um, I think that's fantastic. I'd love to know that for the whole county. There were a couple of, of questions that Commissioner Walters, I know, and myself that were specific to our district. I was willing to give those up, but I think at the meeting we talked about a way to add those, and I think that's what you're proposing still. So if you would not, if you would, wouldn't mind sending me any questions that didn't get, that didn't fit into a countywide question. Um, right. You see what I'm saying? Just so I can verify, I think there's probably only two or three questions. That's why I said it's it's a half a page, really, for commission questions. Right. Yeah, same, so I, same thing send those me. out as soon as possible. That would the one be that I can think of off the top of my head is I had asked a question about Turner Rec specifically because I have a separate recreation commission that serves my district. So I, obviously that didn't get incorporated into the countywide. So if you can just look and see, I can't think of the other ones off the top of my head, but see if there were That's any that weren't incorporated. Water question too, yes, I think. yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. The question I have is they're going to go back and do this. I want to make sure it's what the commission wants. So, but we, um, how soon can this be brought back to the commission or can it be done by email to make sure that it stays moving? Um, because I don't want to, if I don't want to wait till the next commission meeting necessarily because we're on a time crunch in terms of getting it. I also, don't want it to get out and the commissioner say, my questions weren't on there. So we have to balance that to make sure it's right. So Mr. Bach, do you have a recommendation on how we finalize this and get the group working on collecting the survey data? I mean, I think we can turn around documents and get those back before the commission in the next week. You know, so you would all have that and be able to comment back on it. And if that reaches your satisfaction, I guess I'd operate this way, Mayor. If we feel like, and you're, you're leaving a little bit here, but I mean, and we'll try to get it. If we feel like we're getting everybody's answers back in and we're good for the few commissioners where we're at, then we would go forward. Otherwise, we'd need to come back on, what, the 25th and do a similar session. But that's going to push us back almost a month on the survey date and that that starts to crunch us a little bit more than I think you're wanting to from the the data coming back in so if we can work within the next week to two weeks to get this out uh, we'll be in a better place and if I can have your confidence that we can do that if we feel like we've got that information we would do that without coming back so let me ask the so we could call a special session 
Um, I want to, um, I feel like if we get an email sign off by the commissioners who are submitting questions, then we're going to count that as good. Yes. Yes. All right. Are there other commissioners that might want questions? And if so, I'll get with you immediately. that's fine. Yeah. Talk to Mr. Grimm and get him in there and let's get him done. All right. Thank you for working on this. It's not as easy as it sounds doing a survey. The consensus I heard was the 82,800. Is that right? Well, I was right. thinking about that. Maybe just for a little less heartburn for, for everybody, Commissioner McGee, and just to make sure, get something in writing from Chris to say, maybe get into the contract and addendum, just saying we're 100% sure what we're going to get for all commission districts. Is that? That's I, a I'd great idea. That. Yeah. And I think you can use the survey <laughs> that I showed the commission that, I, that they did in 2008. Okay. So should I take it that if we don't get the satisfaction back from Chris that we're getting it more into that one hundred box area that makes us with that confidence, then you're directing me to take it to the higher level to get that done? Okay. All right. If we're in for a penny, we're in for a pound. We're, we, we prefer, we'd prefer the 50 cent piece. I don't think, I think we're way past the penny. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate your work on this. That brings us to our uh, next item, which is a discussion on water pollution control rate structure. Mr. Bach, would you like to tee this up for us? Yeah, this is, again, another follow-up to a standing committee we had in December. Um, in that meeting, we came in. We were talking about how we were moving forward with different projects in the community. Um, how we'll be working toward the pending consent decree. Um, during that meeting, there were specific questions asked about the rate structure, um, how we chart, how we build our rates, and how we're paying off, and how we pay for different things within that. So, this presentation is built in a little bit different direction. It's come to answer those questions. It's really not directed toward what we're doing toward our all our big future projects, but really answering the questions about our rates. So. Trenton Fogelson and Mike Tobin. Trenton Fogelson is with our Water Pollution Control Division. Mike Tobin, Public Works, are here this evening to uh, present on this topic. Gentlemen. Um, as Doug just mentioned, I'm going to do a quick overview of both the Sanitary Sewer Fund and the Stormwater Utility Fund and then the rate structure. So the sewer system overview, uh, <coughs> sorry, the sewer system fund is an enterprise fund. Basically, that means we run it like a business. All of our costs associated with it, we try to recoup in our user fees. And so those are set at rates to cover what our operating costs are. <coughs> sorry, the background of the, of the sewer fund is that it covers all the costs associated with our collection system, uh, collecting the wastewater, conveying it to the treatment plants, treating it. I'm going to try to move quick for you all. Um, here's a revenue overview. This is just taken right out of the um, budget document that's been approved for 2016. I wasn't going to really spend a lot of time on it. It's just in here uh, to look at. You can see that our charges for service, the $33 million out of a $33 million budget, basically it, that, that's where 98% of our funding comes from is the user charges. Um, in the user charges, um, it, it's also referred to as the water pollution abatement fee in the ordinance. It, the basis of that bill, it has two components. Um, it's got a, a base fee, which is like a connection access charge. And then it's also got a, a variable charge, a volumetric charge that's based on each user's uh, volume of water usage. And that volumetric charge is determined during the winter months. So for, for us, we use... November, December, we use December, January, February, and March. So a four month, winter month average. And then that rate is used throughout the year until a, a, a future winter use would be determined. And for can you explain year. why that is? Yeah, the, the reason for that would be that we would not be charging people for uh, water usage, such as irrigation, car washing, po swimming, swimming pools. 
things where the water ultimately does not get back into the sewer system and come to the tr plants for treatment. And so that, that's a pretty standard structure that utilities in the area use and, and nationwide to calculate a fair rate for wastewater. And is that true both for commercial and residential? No, this is just for residential. Actually, I've got a summary down below there. The residential is based on the winter average, uh, as I just described. The commercial is based on actual water usage per month. And, but the rates are the same, the access fee and the volumetric charges are the same. It's $3.66 366 per 100 cubic feet each month. Um, fog generators, which are like restaurants and certain industries that are being uh, coated where they generate fats, oils, and grease, um, those have increased maintenance costs on our system. And so they're, the volumetric charge for those are about 25% higher for each CCF. Um, industrial non-permitted users are, are set up the same as a commercial, so it's just the monthly actual water usage plus the access fee. And then we do have permitted industrial users, and it would be the same as a commercial, plus there are uh, loading surcharges that get applied based on sampling that we do or they do. And, and each month that varies based on what that lo actual loading conditions are. Can you give an example? Um, on the industrial? Yeah. Like, like BOD, uh, biological oxygen demand, for us to take that out of the stream, it takes more effort for us. We have to pump more oxygen into the wastewater to, to pull that out. And so there's an increased treatment cost for those. And what kind of industrial usage would use that? Um, Maybe, maybe, yeah, all kinds of uh, processing, any kind of a, like a, a food processor would be putting some of the byproducts into the waste stream. It would take extra effort to would purify. Take extra, yes. Yep. Yes. Thanks. Before I move, any, does, did that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I just put at the bottom here uh, just a sample. It's just a summary kind of a, of a equation how that's calculated. Our base fee is 1623. So everyone pays 1623 plus $3.66 per CCF. So just for information for the public, if you never turn on your water spout, you never take a drink of water out of your faucet, you still pay $16 to be hooked up to a live utility. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That, you, with the winter average, that kind of complicates it. But yeah. <laughs> because in theory, it's capped off the winter usage. Right. And then we carry that through the whole year. That's good. Uh, we get that question a lot from landlords who say, I have any, we have, I don't even have anybody in there. Why am I paying $16? But there's a $16 hookup fee just to have the live utility service. That's correct. And actually, um, that's that's not uncommon. It's the same, basically the same type of a structure for water and electric as well on their bill. So our base fee is sixteen and sixteen twenty three. The BPU electric um, they call it the the electric customer access charge is sixteen dollars, and the the BPU water is nineteen thirty five. That's just to be connected with no use. Right. So that's for a very active account, and that's the same. That's the one the. When that question came up, um, when is the sewer fee collected? It's any time it's an active water account. Yes. Is, is when the, the wastewater charge would be collected. Okay. I, I presented this last time to it, just so you could see, again, just kind of where we fit in, in the region, national average, upper 30s, uh, about $37 per month. Is an average sewer bill. That's just the sewer bill, yeah. Um, just a breakdown of our expenditures in this, the sewer fund. Again, this is out of the um, just out of the approved budget document, and personnel is about a fourth of our uh, expenditures. Capital outlay is about a fourth of it. Commissioner Felbrook, do you have a question? Well, yes. 
I just had someone who contacted me recently and would like to understand why, since they don't have a sewer, that they're on that they're on septic, that they have to pay this sewer charge. They shouldn't. When if we get an inquiry like that, we investigate that, and and it it does happen. We do find people who either are on the sewer system and haven't been paying it, and we rectify that, or we find people when they notify us where we will. I will turn this on over to that. you. Thank yes. you. Sure. If they're not on sewer, you only pay the sewer fee if your wastewater goes into the sanitary sewer. If it. So, Mayor, I just tell you, I was I asked that question years ago when I first okay. got on the commission. Now stay tuned because there's also a stormwater utility fund that is different from sewer. There's sewer and stormwater. It's two different funds, and they're billed differently. So, stay tuned. The sewer system fund is only for people who are whose drains go into our sewer system that we have to clean. The the stormwater fund is for everybody because all the city streets collect stormwater. So there's two different funds because there are many people who do not pay the sewer fund but do pay the stormwater fund, though I don't think there are many in the inverse who would pay the stormwater but right. would pay the sewer anyway. So yes. Everybody pays stormwater, period. But not everybody's paying sewer. Sewer, that's correct. Okay, well, I will tell you, I'm like Commissioner Markley. I have a number of people. I have people that, at, at the advice of former employees in public works, <laughs> they were, I, was, I directed them, they were required to pay that. So if I could get something in small and in writing that I could post on my political Facebook page to let people know that think they're paying that, who to contact so they can be removed from that, that would be helpful. So it can be investigated because I will say, I know a lot of people who don't know where their toilet flushes, yes. and so they might be confused. And the biggest confusion is through stormwater. But yes, if you're on a septic system, you should not be paying a sewer system fund. Correct? That's correct. Yeah, and, and what we would do when we investigate those, would, we would look at a map and look at that address and our system. The ordinance does require, if they're within 200 feet of it, that they would have to connect to the sewer system, and then they would start paying. So It requires them to connect if they're on septic and within 200 feet? So there's lots of exceptions to this rule. Because you just said if you're not, if you're on septic, you don't have to pay the storm sewer. Now you're saying if you're not on it but you're within 200 feet, you not only got to pay it, but you got to connect to it. Well, if you're in violation of our ordinance for unsanitarily disposing of your sewer or your waste in our community, then we're going to make you connect. Yeah. There are some exceptions to that, but that's the general rule that's in the ordinance, that if, if there's structures within 200 feet of a public sewer system, then they would, con they would be required to connect, and then once they're connected, then they would pay the user, the user fee. How, Mr. To Mr. Tobin, do you want to say something? Yes, I would perhaps to bring some clarity. The uh, if you would still any of the commissioners, mayor, uh, administrators, it, it's base, ba blah, blah. It's better to do this on a case by case basis. If you send it in, we'll investigate it and we'll check it out. Uh, one of the reasons that that the people were required to come off a of septic and attach to the sewers was number one for public health reasons, but two. Uh, the, the clay in this county is not really uh, what you want for septic systems, and, and they tend to, uh, historically, they've always been problems. And, and, and even now, and, and you can verify this with Rob, to, to have a septic system, you have to have over an acre lot, or at least an acre lot. Commissioner Markley? Yeah, I was just going to make a recommendation on how to handle that sort of notification of the public, if there's a way on their bill that they can tell what's the stormwater and what's the sewer, I would post a picture of the bill on your website, highlight it and say, this is your sewer fee, this is your wastewater fee, everybody pays this one, but if this one's showing up and if you're not on the sewer, you should call us, because otherwise I think everybody's going to call thinking that stormwater there. fee is the sewer fee. There it is Hoping. right there. <laughs> so, the, so I just skipped ahead a little bit. But, so here's the front of a BPU bill on the left and the back of the BPU 
BPU bill on the right. So the front of the BPU is on the BPU bill is on the far left here. So you can kind of see what part of it I blew up. Um, but this is this is an actual bill. This is how it's broken down and how it's presented. Uh, the electric and the water's up top. Those are shown as BPU charges, and then the way they they present it, it's their UG charges there together. So the first one is the storm water management fee. I haven't talked about that, but basically that's a flat fee, four dollars and fifty cents for all developed properties, and that that gets billed in association with the electric part. That's how they determine basically that it's an it's an improved property is it's got electricity so that's how we kept that's how the when the mayor was talking about people paying the storm fee and not the wastewater that picks this would pick up every people who are on septic systems yeah and, and this is exactly what I'm looking for only I would go even further because I'm not sure that people necessarily are going to know what the water pollution abatement means but I would say put this up on your website so people can see it and so they'll understand you're going to pay storm water no matter what, but if you're seeing this other charge and you're not on sewer, call us. Otherwise, everybody's just going to call, like, like Commissioner Murgia said, they're going to call hoping that they're paying something they shouldn't have to be. This way you can kind of clarify that and let them know you're going to pay this no matter what, but if this one's showing up and you're not on sewer, that's when you should call in and hopefully kind right. of cut down on some of your workload there. The other common call we get from people, particularly landlords, is a trash removal service. They'll say, hey, wait, I don't have anybody in my in my apartment or my house there's no trash coming uh, no but there's no trash being produced if you have utilities turned on we automatically charge a trash service is that correct mr. Tobin yes it is mr. mayor the uh, we have always uh, tracked the trash fees and the collection of that user fee through the BPU electric rates if you're an active electric customer you pay that charge even if you're playing the fat flat monthly fee you're still paying for trash pickup yes that's right and it's been that way since day one of the contract in 93 that's right okay Commissioner Philbrook sorry we're getting out of order here but this is why we need this presentation because it if we're confused I guarantee that people watching back in TV land are confused yeah no kidding um, yeah it's I know we're really down in the weeds but that's where most of our phone calls come from is water weeds and sewer and all that kind of thing so I'm wondering if there's some way you could put together maybe about a 15 minute here here is the way it is in the you know with these charges why they are and some of these reasons why they might have to be on sewer or not and what some of those caveats are that way when we get those phone calls we can just go ahead and say hey this is the way this is set up but I can set you up with an appointment to speak to the gentleman if they want to that way we're not getting all those calls uh, you know as the rest of the commissioners say you're not going to get 20 million calls but we will get calls I, and you know and I don't like to have to turn everything over all the time having this presentation on our website and being able to point to people who call us to the website for a better explanation I think this is going to be a big help already well, you're going to hear from it because I'll, I'll probably come down and talk to you about this stuff so I know it myself. Thanks. Commissioner Johnson. Um, this may be a loop question. I'm just looking at the total revenues versus the total expenditures in terms of how we budgeted. Um, and we have, we're budgeting a loss. I didn't catch this in the budgetary system, I mean, budgetary session. So because there are so many numbers, I'm not always sure where to point my arrow at. But I just noticed when we have a loss, are we, in the psychology of the budget, are we looking to other areas to cover that um, in, in the overall budget? Mr. Bach, do you want to answer that? Well, Brenton, why don't you go ahead and answer from there and after that? Well, I, in, in, this, in this cycle, when you look at it, there, it is maybe upside down, if you want to use that word. Um, overall, you know, there are years where we are uh, borrowing more money. A lot of our funding is, is debt financed. Yeah. Um, so overall, we, you know, we're targeting trying to carry the uh, the 10 percent reserve. But there are there are cycles where we're maybe adding more to the reserve or taking more out of the reserve. In this case, we're taking more out. You'll okay. This year, in particular, we had about two and a half million extra in capital outlay. Yeah, I see that. Cash fund a little bit more um, in 
I'll also notice we have for years, this is an area where we are, you know, we have rate increases where we continue to go. To is your mic on? Thank you. Rate increases that we've had to continue to deal with, continue to cover the amazing amount of infrastructure that we are required to build in this department across I, our community. I guess that's what I was kind of getting towards is, is are we kind of chasing, I suppose, the expenditures as they come or uh, with the fees or, or are we able to tell are we able to pro uh, to to project what we think they're going to be or we just kind of have to look at a history of the trail uh, the tracking of how they've gone I suppose we're able to project it and I think that kind of covers a little bit over the other side of the discussion commissioner not as much what we'll get into tonight but as we continue to move through this pending consent decree that is part of the meetings we'll be having with you part of the discussion that we're having with the uh, EPA about what we will have to and what we will have to agree to pay and then we will have pretty good projections for what our 20-year costs are going to be and then dividing that back over the years and how we're going to do it and then what we're going to need to do with our rates in order to meet that per what the EPA is going to require us to do very good thank you all right Continue on, please, where I think we're at stormwater. Yeah, I'll, I'll skip back a little bit. All right, that's where we were. Um, so on the stormwater uh, utility fund, again, it's it's an enterprise fund as well. It's It was only established, um, what would that be, seven years ago. Can you pull the mic up to speak directly? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, the stormwater utility fund was, was created about seven years ago, and it funds uh, not only the stormwater infrastructure, but also there's there's kind of a newer compliance piece that goes with the stormwater, um, and we we everyone kind of loosely calls it MS4, which is just an, an acronym for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. That kind of parallels the combined sewer system in the eastern part and the western part of the the county. We have a an MS4 system, and so we are doing increased efforts for compliance as part of our stormwater management plan as well as address the stormwater infrastructure needs. And I mentioned it earlier already, but the, the stormwater management fee is a flat fee, $4.50, currently charged on all improved properties, and that's billed in conjunction with the electric accounts through BPU. Now, I want to say something about that, too, because I was here in 08 when we instituted this. There's another, other communities factor this in based on impervious service, surface on property. So if you have a large roof area or a large parking lot, you would be charged more than a residential customer. A residential customer has a much smaller footprint. A Walmart or a Target has a much larger footprint. We've made a decision to st stick with a flat fee of 450 at this time and not to go into a calculated assessment of parking lot and rooftop surface. Is that right? That's correct. So we could make this harder um, is my point. <laughs> All right. So here's a revenue over overview. It's real simple on this one. Almost everything is uh, the 450 charge for service. Um, expenditure pretty straightforward. Um, here's here's how we compare to surrounding communities. The axis on the left, the vertical axis on the left, is total revenue. So that would be a function of the rate and the number of customers in our system. The axis on the right is the monthly fee. And so if you look at the star, if you find the star for each community and follow it to the right, you can kind of see where, where, what the fees are. And you can see 450 is right on the average rate there. Um, the bars, the blue represents the revenue generated from the residential component. Yellow represents the component generated up from the commercial component. So you can kind of see in the other communities, there's a little bit more of a balance overall, commercial residential. Ours is, is, is more heavily weighted on the residential part. Okay. I don't think we need to cover the bill again, although I'm willing to if anybody wants to. <laughs> yeah. 
I just included some of the definitions on the back of the bill kind of for, for future reference just to see that like the CCF, the winter average, BPU does provide that on the back of everybody's bill. And then when we when we met last, um, one of the things that, that came up was from uh, Commissioner McKiernan talking about disruptions in the neighborhoods and everything. And, and uh, I think we've already talked about it that it, um, it won't really be I think your concern was maybe towards a certain utility that's out there now doing a lot of disruptive uh, work. Um, we, we, we spent a lot of effort trying to minimize those disruptions for several reasons. Um, first, we end up with the best end result. When we get done and pave over, we're left with a good uh, paved surface that isn't going to get disrupted for several years uh, down the road. Um, and that we try to coordinate that as early as we can. And it's really been a successful program through the NSRP where the BP water electric, they talk to the gas, the sewer uh, utilities. We all come in, look at the areas a couple years ahead of time. We go out and we do all of our inspections and try to identify what the needs are, address them, you know, at this time before it gets paved. Then when they come in and do the paving, it, it's, we end up with a better end product and a paved surface that won't be disrupted for, for many years to come. Um, I also mentioned the last time that we, we try to detect these defects. We call them defects in our system as early as we can for, for several reasons. Um, one, we avoid emergencies. Basically, if we let it run until it fails, pipe collapses, we get backups, potentially someone's basement out of a manhole. We're out there overnight fixing it, um, either paying our crews overtime, continuous or contractors premium rates to come in and do those repairs. Um, and we also have uh, environmental instances there where we're having to release a sewage to a creek or to someone's house. That's obviously something we try to avoid. Um, also by catching them early, sometimes we can, we can catch it when it's just maybe a, a small point defect, kind of nip it in the bud. Um, over time, that defect will grow. More soil will fall in the hole, kind of go away. It'll cause undermining of the rest of the pipe under the road. It becomes a much bigger issue to fix, um, protect the other assets, the roads. And then also the other op opportunity we have um, is using uh, something that called trenchless technology. So we can basically access our sewer pipes from manholes and pull a different pi a new pipe in place, cure it in place, and basically have a renewed asset without digging up the street. Obviously, it's a lot less expensive. It's a lot less disruptive. It, that requires that we find defects before they fail. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll go in and we'll find a, a pipe that might have a few defects. We have to dig up a small area, repair those, line it, move on. But it's linear footage to do the trenchless versus digging it up. It's, prob it's probably not quite an order of magnitude, but, but nearly an order of magnitude savings. Commissioner McKiernan. Just had a couple of questions. So I appreciate, because I certainly am, being here in the East End, I'm very concerned that we could theoretically trench up every street, every alley. Although if you want to dig up the alleys and then put them back nice, you could go ahead and do that. Uh, but but I just want to make sure that that we minimize the disruption because it, it at, at first glance, when I think about it, it has the potential to be enormously disruptive of every single res or structure in my district, and I want to make sure that we avoid that. And I think, as I talked to Mr. Tobin and now as I've talked to you, that I'm getting a better appreciation that it won't be on the scale that I had imagined, and that's good, and that you will work to try to minimize it and coordinate it, and that'll be great sure. as well. Sure. Um, just a curious question, though. As we talk about people who are currently on septic needing to hook up to a sewer if it's in within X distance away, I have no idea. What would be the average cost of somebody uh, hooking up to the sewer? What would a homeowner spend if they were to hook up on average? I don't know that I have a, 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 a great number. It would, be, it would be thousands of dollars, though. So probably. four or five thousand dollars? Probably, probably more than five to ten. I'm, I'm guessing it might be. It might be less. You know, it's so dependent upon the surface okay. area and the and, and the the surface restoration. That's really where you get into the money, is the surface restoration. Right. So, okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, do you know? I think Mr. Uh, 
Roddy used to quote us the number of miles of sewer that we take care of. Do you have that number approximation? Yeah, total it's about uh, 1,200 miles. About 1,200 miles um, of sewer, which would take us from here to the East Coast, I think. Pretty close. It's a long way. Yeah, in our, in our presentation, we, we show one where you can go from Sporting Park to Chicago and back to Sporting Park. Round trip to Chicago. Can we just send our sewage one way and have them pay for treatment? <laughs> that seemed to be cheaper. Commissioner Walker. Uh, <clears throat> I assume we've reached the end of your presentation. Look at the picture. Yeah, yeah. I see it. <laughs> um, I was uh, contacted by a business owner and uh, property owner who's in the audience who wanted to present to the commission tonight on this subject. Present meaning there are some inequities in this in this uh, formula. At least he feels there are, um, and. Uh, I would think that it would behoove us before we enter into any further discussion on this that we hear what those inequities are and perhaps Mike and they can address the uh, perhaps they aren't inequities perhaps you know we can move on so and he's here to speak on this item as a, a member of the public anyway so he's allocated a certain amount of time anyway well, only when we have a public hearing or open it. If there is a motion and a second by this commission to allow the man three minutes to speak, then we could grant that. I make that motion. It has been, it's properly before us. Roll call. Not roll call. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is done. Sir, you yeah, may speak for three minutes. Please state your name and address for the record. For those that are interested, he's from the Rosedale area. Hi, my name is uh, Rick Props. I have a retired small business, 25 years in Wyandotte County. I have a rental house that has been vacant for three months, and my BPU bills for three months for the electric and the water total was $14.59, and my bills totaled $316.95. And of that $316, one-third of it was for the water pollution abatement. Here's how it works. A new customer, like a renter, homeowner, or landlord, must pay an estimated sewer fee for minimum four months before March 31st. The last four months usage is average to establish the winter average. And if you were to move into a, occupy a rental property in March, you'd have to pay this fee um, for one year. The customer for this first year must pay an estimated sewer fee, which is based on five CCFs of water usage each month for 12 months. One CCF of water is 750 gallons times five is 3,750 gallons of water, which is 125 gallons of water per day. And in a one bedroom house with a square footage of 700 feet, one or two people living there, it's impossible to use that much water. Uh, this fee is charged across the board regardless of how much water you use and regardless of how much water you conserve, regardless of the size of the house, the number of bedrooms, the number of people, the yard size, and without considering the history of the water minute, usage. You have one minute, sir. What? You have one minute remaining. Okay. Thank you. My suggestion, I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff. I can go back you if you want me to. Continue. My suggestion is to pay as you go. New customers, why pay an estimated bill? We have the technology to pay for the water as we use it and the sewer fees as a usual fee. 
and then March 31st, when March 31st comes, average the last four months bill for an exact winter average, and you have a customer who's got every drop of water they had paid for and sewer fees paid in full with every penny due and no unfair estimates. I think we need an investigation of all the charges and fees on the entire BOP bill and find out why these unfair charges are created and also prorate fairly um, the amount uh, due on bills when leases begin or end uh, causing partial billing period. My, my house that I have is 700 square feet. It has low flow faucets, low flow shower, low flow toilet, no sprinklers, no hot tub, no pool, and has a winter average of one CCF since 2007. That house has averaged less than one CCF of water usage per month. And I'm being charged, or they are charging for uh, five CCFs of water per month, every month, all year. Okay, sir, we appreciate your um, bringing that to us today. And I think um, I would ask um, uh, Commissioner Walker um, to talk to you and work out a um, what you think would be a possibility um, and then we would have to talk about a policy discussion about what the financial impact would be to the system and what the what would be a fair rate but it would be a policy discussion so I think we um, if you could make sure you um, could give that in, uh, copies of that information that you've given um, to to mr. do you have that mr. Walker I have his his handwritten presentation perfect then we just need to evaluate that um, and see if the Commission has an appetite for a policy change Commissioner Walker I, I I think what he what he gets across is is that while for most of us measuring it in the winter average results in the best rate it is it is not uniformly equal to everyone's situation uh, water conservation is kind of out the window in the, in the sense that it, it it doesn't seem to be of any benefit for you to conserve water. You you have a number of houses that he has described in this community that are uh, not a lot different. I mean, size wise, limited facilities. Uh, you know they may use more water I you know it's hard to tell it is it is a policy question that we have to decide I you know I've I've, I've talked with mr. props and I've had issues with him when I was chief counsel over the years he's been somewhat of an activist in his community and he he had a business and uh, I won't say he was always wrong or, or right but he he was very articulate in his uh, his point and when he explained to me this situation, I couldn't answer it. And I still can't answer why somebody using one CCF of water is charged for five on the sewer charge. I can't answer that. And while that may work out for everybody else, uh, it doesn't work out for him. And it probably doesn't work out for, a, a, I hope, a small percentage of people. But I don't know what I can I'll be happy to work with Rick, but I don't think it's me and Rick that have to work together. No, no I think we need Mr. Tobin and, and Trent involved here to get this, uh, get this, get this evaluated because this is the question I would have. His question isn't with the winter average. His question is with the five CCF on a typical account that's used prior. Mr. Tobin, we'll we'll be happy to work with you both ways on this with Hal and, and with the citizen. Uh, but again, it will come back to a policy issue. You know, we, as as administrative staff, we, you know, we apply the policy equitably in, in across the board. Yes. There's no question about uh, that's not the question is do 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 we need to look at the policy and adjust for or have a process where an individual such as him can appeal to I, I don't know water pollution I guess uh, and 
given certain facts, that rate be adjusted upward or, well, upward or downward, presumably <laughs> downward. Uh, adjusted but, downward uh, or left alone, right? And, it, and <laughs> if so, is it more trouble than it's, uh, I mean, is it going to cost us a lot more than it's going to that be a benefit? How much money, what's the budget impact on you guys? I can't, I can't answer those in a vacuum. But we'll need you all to do that analysis. Do the analysis on the budget impact and what a policy would look like. If we, and then we'd have to decide if the commission has an appetite to take it up. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming yes. out tonight for thank presenting. You, thank you, Mr. Props. And you're welcome to stay for the uh, exciting sign presentation that Rob Richardson is going to. It will be riveting. Uh, Commissioner Townsend. Thank you. I just want to say one thing. I know that uh, Mr. Props is not alone because at least one of, one or more of my constituents has outlined a similar case. So, uh, and this issue was new to me. So I just want to make sure that we're talking about possibly, uh-oh, not that. <laughs> a waste of water. Is this one CFI or CFI? Oh, no. Will you please bill the commissioner for the water she just <laughs> built? Say just one thing? But, uh, I just uh, wanted to say one thing. This would be a change that would be beneficial to all of our constituents, right? Or I guess the question is the constituents that called me with a similar situation, do we want to hear from them or, or have them sit in their particular circumstance or how are we going to address that? I think we just need to have the data run and see what the policy looks like because there's going to be a dollar figure attached to it and we need to see it. We don't even know what the scale of this is. Sir, yep. my yep. situation is only for a, a new customer. So it wouldn't be applied to anybody that has I understand that. Okay. It's only for a new customer. And because you rent, you have new customers more often than regular houses. Mr. Pro, would you like to have a copy of this if you hand it out? It gives you more some information. If I could, Commissioner Townsend, if you refer that address to us, we'll be happy to look into that for you also. Thank you, because this gentleman had rental property as well. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right. Mr. Richardson, thank you for returning again. I know you love being here for the non-planning and zoning portion of our meeting. Others have to sit through my presentations enough. It's probably only fair. <laughs> That's right. Tim, what is this? That's up. I don't know what to do with the box that's up there. Okay, I don't have OK on my <laughs> on my device here. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission. Um, as you know, we are in the process of rewriting our sign code. It's a part of our zoning ordinance, and it deals with how, when, and where people can place signs in the community. <clears throat> One of the key reasons for regulating signs is aesthetics, and I believe. Um, one of the things our consultants wanted us to do was to do some surveying uh, around the community about uh, what signs people like and what signs people don't like. So if you're at home and you want to do this, if you go to uh, wycokck.org slash planning, in the bottom middle of the page, there's a sign survey score sheet. Uh, you can print that off and fill it out, mail it or email it. I'll put this information back up at the end. but. Go to the, uh, the planning page on the county website. Uh, if you need to navigate to it, it's just the regular website, and then go to, de to departments and then urban planning and land use. The purpose of this uh, is to gauge your response tonight to these signs. You all have a score sheet that I've handed out to you. Our chief counsel has informed me that uh, you need to put your name on that. We'll collect, the clerk will collect those and keep those for record um, for posterity. But we want to see how you all feel about the different types of signs. Uh, this will give us direction as we move forward. We're going to do this with the Planning Commission Saturday morning um, in their special session to uh, get an update on all of our planning projects. Um, and it will help us to consider uh, different ways that potentially we can regulate signage that uh, might be better than the way we're doing it now. Um, so. When we get into these signs, each slide is going to have a variety of signs on it. And uh, if you really like it, rate it a 5 on the yellow side. If you really hate it, rate it a negative 5 on the red side. Make all the notes that you can on here, because this will help us. You might want to say something, well, this would be OK in an industrial area, but I don't want it in my neighborhood. So as many notes as you can make would be great. And 
we can do this in, in probably 20 minutes um, if we look at the slides and make notes. Mayor, would you like to comment at this point? Yeah, so we can make this a 20-minute process or we can make this a two-hour process, and that's really up to the will of the commission. My recommendation is going to be if you have a particular question about a sign, circle it, and then we'll come back to it at the end. And then if you want to have a long conversation with Mr. Richardson about that particular type of sign, we can do that at another time. Correct. So let's cruise through this and get the information. And um, I believe we have A through N in slides with signs on them, so you'll know how to prepare yourself for this. Our first slide is uh, what we would typically refer to as poll signs. Um, so there's four of them there, and we'll give you a, uh, a minute or so to make your evaluations and write your scores down. When I see you're all kind of looking back up here, I'll change the slides. Let's just mark an X in the box. Yep. Yeah, just mark an X in the box. Look at my score, Mayor. Hey, stop cheating on me. <laughs> um, next. All right. So these are uh, different types of monument or pole signs. We have some like these in our community in different places. And the more distinction you give in your scoring, the more it will help us to kind of rate this as, as we move through and see what different places we should, you know, parts of the community might want something like this, some may not. Please keep your eyes on your own sheet. <laughs> We ready? No. <clears throat> ready? Go. <laughs> I particularly like the mushroom. <clears throat> group C. And if you all have neighborhood groups that you think might like to do this, we'd be happy to go out and talk to the neighborhood groups about any of these planning processes or run through this with them. I mean, the more the more people that participate, the better off we'll be. So far, people haven't been real excited in the sign code process. Well, we have, you know, some of these are still legal within our code to do signs like this. You know, some of them, people want to do something that's unique or different. Um, you know, if you, you could regulate signage so tightly that everything kind of looked alike. <clears throat> and so I think that's part of the reason for the variety and the type that, you know, how much variety do you want to, we'll kind of get, gauge how much variety you would like to see in the code. I'm imagining a big cheese it down in Fairfax. Half of all cheese it's in America made right here in Kansas City, Kansas. Eat more cheese it's, please. In a healthy community's way. <laughs> Are we ready? Ready? Go. <clears throat> We've moved into more of this. Strictly a monument sign. Some of them have changeable messages on them. Like that one.
Can you believe gas is dollar forty nine? That's almost accurate. That's that picture is probably you know, eight or nine years old, but it's back in it's back to being correct again. Dollar <clears throat> that's crazy. Okay, is everybody done? Go. Oh, those are horrible. Horrible. So these are back into our more of our shopping center type signs and advertising for uh, multiple tenants within a shopping center or a strip center. Well, that number five looks great. <laughs> hey, quit trying to influence the vote. That's the Legends Shopping Center right here in KCK. <clears throat> one thing, when you look at this one in particular, um, think about how difficult or easy it is to read these. And I think that's one where the Legends has done a good job. You can tell what the, I mean, the use of logos and things makes that a lot easier to see. Anybody still working? All right, here we go. So now we have some electronic signs. Um, number one, number two, number three, number six are all um, what I would call changeable. Some of them are video related, and then you have the gas stations that can just automatically change the price of gas. See, there's a 329 for you, Mayor. That's more common. 379. <clears throat> These signs are um, somewhat vertical. They're a little bit higher, different ways to do a vertical sign. I think one in five, this is a sign type that Lee Summit's created. And, you know, it gets a little higher so that people can see it a little farther away. It's kind of unique. It's kind of an archway. It's more of an industrial application. So this, that might be one where you say, well, that'd be fine in Fairfax, or you know, maybe you like it somewhere else too. But that, that's one that we've had people want to make notes on in the previous presentations. We don't necessarily dislike it, but it, they think it wouldn't be appropriate everywhere. Ready? Yeah. Go. Oh, number one. Let's get that one done. The mobile sign. Mobile sign. Uh, and number one's interesting because you have some businesses that that truck would be used almost every day, and you have some of them that it's sitting in the parking lot with flat tires. Or it's a. One is the sign. Yeah, it can be. You know, we've had a mattress company have a trailer that was not big enough to have a mattress put in it with signs on it parked in their parking lot before. I just put these are horrible. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is the worst page. The banner issue is going to be an issue number three. And so is number, a sign like number four, as I've said before, was the subject of the Reed versus the town of Gilbert, Arizona case. It was about that big of a sign that caused the Supreme Court action. 
minutes less to tonight. Ready? Yep. Now we're kind of awnings and awning signs and different types of ways to do signage on, uh, you know, storefronts. Group I. How do I call these? Make that note. Make that note. <laughs> if kept up, right? Yeah. You know, the, the companies have gotten a little bit better with that. They're, they're, you know, some of them, they make those out of metal now so that they don't, you know, it looks the same from a distance, but it doesn't, um, it wears better. We ready? Now the the first one is it's a, like a sidewalk sign. There's just a little placard out there that's got you know legs on to keep it upright there. You can't see the legs on it very well. <clears throat> and on some of these, you might say, okay, but, you know, not every day, a couple weeks a year. Or maybe if the sidewalk is wide enough, it's okay, or, you know, comments like that. Is there a limit to how long you can have a grand opening? Can you be in your third year of business and still be a grand opening? Right. Well, it's although, can you have been in business for ten years and been going out of business for seven of those? I've seen it. <laughs> Jay, are we done with Jay? Yes. Okay. So now we have some painted signs. Um, Different wall signs. It's okay. Number four is from here in KCK. Ready? <laughs> is it art or is it advertisement? I don't know. And what's kitsch and what's art, right? Do we have a duck word? That must mean it's time to move on to the next group. <laughs> so it's in, in number five, notice the scale of that sign. That's pretty big. There, there's some cars parked in front of it. 
And he doesn't depict this very well here, but think about maintenance on these as well. Like the sign in number two, when it was first painted, um, was much, much brighter. It, it kind of fades like the sunset. I think it's the fish. I think the fish are for sale. <laughs> right. Well, down on Johnson Drive, you know, the, there's a pet store down there that has, they've got a big mural on the whole side of the wall. Yeah, how to regulate murals, that's hard. We're getting another one. There's Fonzies on a building downtown now. Yeah, they can be great art, but... Here's group in. Oh, you weren't done? No, I said we're almost done. Oh, okay. We're ready to move to in? Right. Okay, there we go. This is the, the last. Number five is interesting. Our code, our code currently doesn't allow for neon. I don't know why that was taken out or when, but a lot of zoning codes took neon out a long time ago, and I don't know, maybe because it was so hard to maintain and people couldn't maintain it adequately, and maybe there's not people to maintain it anymore. I don't know. So is uh, number four So while we're discussing signs, I think uh, on the I'll do a more formal presentation to this on the standing committee when I get the final results. But I believe that this week the last urban sign related to the digital billboards came down. They were waiting for they had it had a power line very close to it that had to be um, powered down for them to get in there and, and remove the sign structure. So I think that one the last one was going to come down as soon as the wind um, quit going. So that that issue is. Nearly resolved, and I'll do a formal presentation on it. Yes? One group. So once again, if you were doing this at home, the uh, information on uh, getting the survey back to us is on the screen there. That's all I have, unless you all have comments on specific signs or issues that you saw that came up here. Um, thank you for your participation. A little different than what we normally do, but it's very important. Commissioner McKiernan. I just have one request. I really appreciate all the time that the group is putting into this. Very thoughtful. I have a request. When we finally come up with an ordinance, please make it something that we are able to and willing to enforce. Let's not create any more ordinances and regulations that either we either cannot or will not enforce. We don't need them. The, so that's my only request. The other piece that was not on here <clears throat> were digital signs um, like churches have. And I, obviously, there's one at, I, there was a couple, but I think we need to specifically give feedback about what people think about, because a lot of churches ask them, all of these are very different from what a typical church puts out. They're usually much smaller, lower to the ground, um, and gospel running across the bottom well they just look better than this <laughs> they look better than these I guarantee it but I think if we could um, get feedback from the commissioners because that's a common request and I think when mine was approved Commissioner Markley you get a lot of requests for that um, I think we need to specifically see some church signs and give some feedback for digitizing digitizing church signs because it's a big request that we get well get it for other public buildings too like the library in Argentine we need a monument sign that gives information down there right and so you're gonna see one signs. you're gonna see one I don't know if it's coming to you or Board of Zoning Appeals we have a request from the community college for the tech center where there's a changeable sign in there now they want to replace that with a digital face okay but I think that's information that we've had a request on that I didn't see those kind of monument signs in the slideshow okay all right anything else I'm Thank glad we all. did this, finished it at 9 instead of starting it at 10 last week. That concludes our agenda. We are adjourned.
Congratulations, Mike. Yeah, congratulations. That's four now? Yeah. You got four girls. There's a baby? Yeah, Megan had a baby yesterday. Congratulations. Any more go in coming, you think? I hope not. You need a boy. Ha <laughs> ha. 